Noita being the complicated and complex game that it is, there are bound to be features and mysteries that go mostly unknown by the majority of players. For instance, did you know that there are parrying and headshot mechanics in the game and that it's possible to find wands with up to 66 slots? What? Yep. Follow me, fellow Noita, as I demystify these and other bits of arcane knowledge. We'll begin with one that gets asked about fairly often. At the end of the credits, you can see a section titled Cryptic High Scores, numbered 1 through 20. Who are these people and why are they in the credits of the game? Well, the simple answer is that these are the first people who decrypted and broke into the game's files. After doing so, they encountered this message from the developers. Look at you, hacker. Aren't you a clever one? We're really impressed. Congrats. You now have access to all our secrets, and while we cannot stop you, maybe we can make a little deal? You can leak all the information if you want to, or if you wait until October 11th, 2019 before releasing them, we will put you in the credits of the game. Email us at treble.iplusknower at gmail.com. Side note, isn't that an incredible email address? Of course, nothing will stop you from emailing us, taking the credit, and then anonymously leaking the data, so the deal is this. If the data isn't leaked before, October 11th, 2019, we will include your desired name or nick in the credits. Also, if the data isn't released before, then we'll enable unofficial modding support. So yes, they deserve to be in the credits and they deserve your praise. <laughs> on the very next day after that embargo date on October 12th, 2019, Zathers, probably the first person to hack into the files, posted on the community discord all of the encryption keys for everyone to go ahead and do it themselves. So here are all the keys if you want to try to mess around with decrypting these yourself. And now we move on to that aforementioned parry mechanic. Acquiring the skill and timing to consistently pull this off is probably one of the most difficult things to do in the game. You need to kick at the exact same frame that an enemy would hit you with a melee attack in order to block that damage and reverse that damage actually in a riposte against the enemy. I'm not going to tell you not to spend a lot of time trying to do it, because it might just be a matter of getting good at it, just like tablet kicking. If you can time the animation of your kick in order to perfectly kick a tablet, then you might be able to also perfectly time the animation of your kick in order to frame perfectly, block the melee attack of an enemy, and then repost that damage back onto the creature itself. Anyway, as it is, it's just a very mysterious mechanic that not a whole lot of people actually know about. Sharing that distinction is the headshot mechanic in the game. Have you ever noticed that if you shoot one of the Heesey shotgunners in the head, you tend to do two and a half times as much damage as normal? That's because it's an actual mechanic. But it only works against the shotgunner enemies, including though the new hell shotgunner. Normally a spark bolt does three damage, but if you shoot a shotgunner in the head with it, you'll do seven damage. So anytime you come across a shotgunner, you should be aiming for their head. Because not only do you do more damage this way, especially useful against the health shotgunners, but you might even interrupt their attack. So this could be the difference between taking a face full of pellets or no damage at all. Of course, again, this is the only enemy type in the entire game that takes headshot damage like this, interestingly. And now, did you know that the oil stain actually changes the size and shape of the player's hitbox? Armed with this knowledge, you can actually use an oil stain in order to dig out of a holy mountain. I made a little setup here just to easily showcase this. After I dip myself into the oil, I'm going to press against the wall, because with the oil stain, my hitbox is actually thinner, and then switching over to the water stone to immediately drop that oil stain causes my hitbox to return to normal size or a little bit thicker, which as you can see wedges me into the wall a little bit where I can spam the arrow keys to trigger the unstuck function, just like tablet digging. And then I'm just going to continue to go ahead and do this, just stain myself with oil, press into the wall, drop that stain, trigger the unstuck function, and repeat in order to dig out of the holy mountain with just oil. Of course, this isn't really a very efficient means of doing this, but again, it's just another bit of arcane, mysterious knowledge to add to your tool belt. In a game about knowledge, this is never a bad thing. Continuing with the not quite efficient, weird, arcane, mysterious knowledge, you can actually zombify yourself with the necromancy spell. Just put it on any spell that does self damage and then kill yourself with said spell. And then watch as you become a zombie 
and roam across the world for, in this case, like 20 minutes I let this run and just had fun watching my zombie go on a little journey across the surface here. And yes, I did also try this in the cauldron. Of course I did. I've spent a thousand hours just messing around with the cauldron. In this case, I put a wand in there <laughs> and the Hisi chef and then killed myself, had my zombie pick up that wand and then kill the Hisi chef in there. And of course, nothing happened except for my meat chunks just painting the cauldron red, which was pretty cool, I guess. I don't know. Of course, the game ends, you know, because you die. But what if you could zombify yourself and have the game not end? Maybe it's worth playing around with this to see if we can actually somehow get that to work. Anyway. All right. Now for the most interesting of the entire bunch, especially if you're a wand connoisseur. Typically, the maximum capacity of a wand is 26 slots. However, there is an extremely rare chance to find a wand that is more than 26 slots, such as on seed 108-56910, where we have a 43 slot wand in the Temple of the Art. Or seed 65857-2190, where in the final Holy Mountain, there is a 50 slot wand. Of course, with this many slots, you won't be able to access the end of the wand. So you have to take a lot of care when you're wand building, when you shift click spells onto it, because if you make any mistakes and you won't be able to remove those spells. And as you can see right here in the code, this is intended. It is not a bug. The way that this works is that when the game generates wands, it allocates points to certain of the wand stats, and sometimes it decides to allocate points mostly into capacity. That's why these wands that have a huge capacity tend to have kind of bad stats elsewhere. All of us owe a huge thank you to community member Pudi248 for doing the enormous majority of the legwork and research on all of this. What this boils down to is basically in nightmare mode, you'll be able to find tier 10 shuffle wands in hell. And those wands can have up to 66 slots. Of course, it's still extremely rare to find these. In normal mode, the maximum capacity wand possible to be found is a 62 slot tier 10 non-shuffle from Tiny. However, this does mean that you have to kill Tiny on one specific pixel in the entire world in order for it to spawn. There's also a chance for tier 6 shuffle wands to get up to 50 slots. These wands can be obtained from the bridge boss, the dragon, Tiny, Temple of the Art, the final laboratory, Holy Mountain, and the Wizard's Den. There is also a 1% chance for a great treasure chest to contain a wand like this, and also a very low chance for the Summon Tekasova spell to spawn a wand like this. So again, in normal mode, the maximum capacity that you can find is 62 slots. But if you play in nightmare mode, you can find tier 10 shuffle wands with 66 slots down in hell. That's because they have 20 extra points for the wand generator to distribute amongst the stats when generating them. Again, still extremely rare, but possible. So if you ever find a wand that has over 26 slots, unmodded of course, then know that that is extraordinarily rare. And you might want to report that seed to Reddit or the official Discord or my Discord someplace. Let people know about it. Pudi did make a program, an alternate version of Calyaresis's Orb Atlas, that instead of looking for orbs, it will look for wands such as this. And I'll link that down below in my description. After the developers introduced the fungal shifting mechanic, myself and a lot of other people really, really hoped for a way to possibly obtain extremely dense rock in a flask. Unfortunately, that's not possible. However, the next best thing is now possible, currently on beta branch, because of the potion mixing mechanic. We can, right now, on beta, mix together lava and freezing vapor in order to make dense rock. It takes a little finagling, and I'm not quite sure yet what the most efficient way to do this is without taking a bunch of damage. But as long as you have a majority of dense rock in a flask, you'll possibly be able to shift that. And then you might end up with something like this, which is just glorious, turning the world into actual Swiss cheese. Possibly if you shift dense rock to cheese. Anyway, 
Just in time for the holidays, did you know that if you enter the tree's music room during Christmas time in game, that you can actually tinker with wands in here permanently? It functions just like another holy mountain. There's no time limit to this one. Well, a few days, actually. The wiki lists the 24th to the 26th, but I found that the 23rd also allows me to tinker with wands in here, but that might be just some weird time zone type of thing, so your results might vary. Last but not least, Dunk actually made a video about this, I'm pretty sure, so a large number of people already know this, but if you don't know this, the fish in the holy mountain pools, if you're ever watching somebody and they have a lot of them in here, and you're like, huh, I only have like a few, why is that? It's because the number of fish in the pool exactly correlates to the amount of orbs of true knowledge you've ever obtained while playing Noita. So have one fish, that means you've had one orb, two fish means you've had two, three means you've had three, and 36 means that at one point you've done a 36 orb run. This is permanent. Once you've obtained a certain number of orbs, you'll have that number of fish in your holy mountain pool forever, unless you go ahead and delete all your progress. However, this does open up something interesting. Like I said before a while ago in that video talking about the potential hidden ending in Noita, there is a message in the engine of the game, Kitaxia Kaluista, that translates to thanks for the fish, which again is a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference. So some people have theorized that if we can somehow get 42 fish, we might be able to unlock some other big secret in the game potentially relating to the eyes or the cauldron. Myself and a lot of people have done extensive experiments with this, so far to no avail. But don't let that discourage you, please. Go out there in this game, if you have the ability to, do all of the experimenting that you can. Just because one person did something doesn't mean that you can't do the same thing. Maybe they made a mistake, maybe you do it a little bit differently, and then suddenly you solve the eyes, or you solve the cauldron. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this short video. I hope that you find some of this interesting, if not useful, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day and happy noiting. We'll begin with one that gets asked about fairy. We'll begin with one that. Hey.